Hi everyone, welcome to the second day of IGDC. We have a very exciting talk planned for you, uh, starring uh, Torvi Franz Olafsson. I'll tell you about it in a moment, but uh, let's see who's in the audience. Looks like a large number of you have come. Torvi's got something very exciting lined up. He's going to talk about uh, game narratives today, and he's been around the block, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, at the start of the day, this talk, this conference couldn't be possible without some of our sponsors. So we'd like to take a moment just to recognize them. Our presenting sponsor is Unreal Engine. Our gold sponsors are MPL, Amazon Web Services, Glance and Jungly. Our legacy silver sponsors are Gamation, Luxia and YesGnome, along with Quali and Gameon as bronze sponsors. And our IP Connect sponsor is the Succeed Innovation Fund. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about our speaker today. So Torvi has served many creative business and engineering roles in the video games industry, but most notably, he was the creative director of uh, a very small little MMORPG called EVE Online. Uh, and after that, he was the game director for the AR game Minecraft Earth, and now the creative director at the Minecraft franchise. So um, he's worked on big projects that we all know and love, and uh, now he, so, so he is also from Iceland, but he lives in Los Angeles and his main interests are large online virtual worlds and their communities and engaging with all of that. And in his spare time, he builds and flies and sometimes crashes FPV drones. So let's have Torvi come up here and I'm going to get off. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, my name is Torve Olafsson, and um, I work for Microsoft uh, Minecraft. I work on the Minecraft franchise as a creative director, and uh, I've been in the industry. I'll take a you know, start my presentation in the industry for a while since kind of the late 90s. And uh, most notably, before I worked on a game called EO Online, I co created a game called EO Online with my friends, and I started working on that kind of in the late 90s, and I worked there for 18 years. Uh, here's my deck. Just to confirm, you know, can everybody see my deck? Can everybody hear me? Yep, yep, okay, looks like it. All right. Then uh, let's let's start. Uh, yeah, like I said, I, I've kind of worked in uh, in the industry for for quite a while, and uh, in a lot of different roles. You know, we we started in the industry. We were quite small. The company I worked at, at first, at CCP Games, and uh, it was a really nice experience working in a in a startup means that you are exposed to working in all the jobs. You do all the jobs, not just one highly specialized job. Uh, so I worked with both in programming and in art as an art director and uh, graphics programmer. And uh, and then I wound up working on the intellectual property and writing like story, uh, uh, but mostly then managing and, and, and uh, writers or, or working with other people. Other people would do the, the typing. I would just do uh, pointed things. Like I called it. Uh, it was a lot of fun and uh, a lot of learnings, uh, mostly about how writing for games and, and creating story for games is different than, than creating story for for books or, or film. So I, I, I want just to talk a little bit about that. Now I apologize um, about the level of this uh, talk because uh, I, it's going to start very um, simple, I guess. Uh, I just want to talk about the core basics and then move into some of the thoughts I've had about writing uh, stories for sandbox games and sandbox universes. Now, uh, an abstract game is very difficult to comprehend. You can describe a game, most games, just using symbols and, and numbers. And uh, 
right? and and you can describe like the the rules of the game and the patterns of the game just totally abstract but most people are just not comfortable with it you 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 give them all these rules and the rules simply won't stick uh it's there, there, there are only a few people that that can that can understand the dynamics or the, the joy of the game if you, if you just give them the abstract rules so uh i i think we use stories and narratives uh, not only just to tell a story, but I like a clue for the brain to understand what the different tokens mean. A sword, a shield, a hit point. You know, it's much easier if they have some sort of real world uh, parallels. And now, of course, there are exceptions like, uh, you know, games like Tetris it doesn't really have a story. It had a small, it had like some pictures of different parts of the world, the first version, but, uh, but it doesn't really have a story. But even even uh, casual mobile games that are very abstract will often deploy some sort of story to help you with mnemonics. The story, of course, helps us figure out why and want to play. Why would I? What's the urgency for me even to solve this challenge? Uh, you know, to save the princess. I, like I have to. I have to become king. I have to like, yeah, do do different things. And, uh, and of course, to explain the rules of the game, and most notably, how can I affect the world and how can it affect me? Because it's a complicated world, but we can usually just operate in a very small, confined solution space, and the rest of it is, is rigid. We also establish the stakes. Why should I even care? Why am I trying to solve this problem? Like if no one is in jeopardy, if there's no problem, nobody owes money or no, there's nobody risk. Like why, why would I even engage in, in, in doing it? So, uh, so, uh, we need to create some sort of urgency or anxiety within the, with the players so that they feel compelled to, to like do actions and, and try to affect the story. And of course, you know, we're trying to entertain people at the end of the day. <clears throat> I like to think of chess because chess actually has a has a story, very simple elements, not very many pieces, but the roles are very clear: the queen and the king and the bishop. But even the bishop, like just saying the word bishop, doesn't mean doesn't explain to us how how the chess piece moves. We kind of learn that, but we start identifying it as a a bishop. The bishop starts meaning something else, but it's still. We, we could just call the pieces A, B, C, and D, but it would just be a very, very different game. And even when we tell a story about a game of chess and we describe how a game of chess, how a pawn was taken in and then uh, the knight came, it, it it just becomes more interesting and more more easy to remember. And uh, and what I really like about chess is, is that it's such a simple game. Like the rules are, are not that many but the but the outcomes can be incredibly complicated because it's a very open game i think the the, the number of potential moves is ch in chess is like 10 to the 74th power which is more than the atoms in the universe so and and chess is a really good example of like embracing unexpected outcomes uh not being too uh confined with the roads and making a game where you don't necessarily know all the potential outcomes and, uh, and that's what makes it interesting. Stories can also be like really complex. Of course, we've we've seen uh, as the Last of Us, Red Dead Redemption, and, and, the, and the Witcher. You know, these are very big, long stories with quests, and then and, and in some cases like big side quests. And uh, developing large narrative worlds like this is a, is a massive undertaking, and uh, not most people cannot afford do it or, or, or do not have time to do it and if you're considering making uh, worlds like this just ensure that you have the budget people and tools in time and uh, and also like i've seen some companies and, and friends uh, fall into this trap where the minute to minute and the second to second gameplay isn't a isn't gripping or engaging enough because they're too focused on the on the larger story trying to tell a larger story and, and and so it's interesting when you talk about the game, but then when once you go into playtesting and people start playing it, you, you realize that the kind of the, the small interaction loops of minute to minute and second to second aren't providing like agency or any challenges to a player that they just 
basically flipping pages almost in a book or, or choosing pages in the choose your adventure book uh so so it kind of stops being a game according to our definition of a, of a game and, and I, I like to think about like the story can also be super abstract but it's still a story it doesn't have to be like grounded in reality to be understood by by the audience like the ghosts chase pac-man and and it's a story and, and you can you can tell your friend about like how 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 like the how you almost got the, the pill and the ghost got you and, and 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 it creates a narrative and it creates a story and and, and sometimes it can be very funny like in plants versus uh, zombies it's really abstract why are the plants shooting things at the zombie it's just it doesn't make any sense but somehow it starts making sense the 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 top right picture is from a game called super meat boy about this like little character that doesn't have any skin and it's super gross uh, uh, messy and, and 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 bloody, but it's a it's a it's a story about vulnerability actually, and about being vulnerable. Although I don't think the audience gets that when when playing the game, they just see blood and think it's funny. <clears throat> but even if a if a story doesn't make sense, and and this is a screenshot from Gold Simulator and, and Portal, the story world needs to be consistent. Um, sure, you're familiar with uh, that from from simply IPs like maybe you know, as an example the Star Wars universe or Lord of the Rings where the uh, the rules of the world are, are different than from our world but they're consistent so we start creating a mental model where we fully understand the rules of the world and we start to expect that the world follows its own rules so like in like in portal we start understanding how the portals work and 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 if that would change suddenly mid mid uh, game or mid story, we would we would feel uh, we would like be jolted out of the out of the world. But the more kind of loyal we can be, be to the to the rules of the world, and have the game follow the rules of the world, the uh, the the more the the player will get engaged to it, and the IP starts making sense and starts becoming real in their in their world. I, I like really like Limbo because uh, it doesn't really have any words, but it tells a story. So, like, story doesn't necessarily mean words. You can tell a, a story, a really interesting or a creepy story, without saying saying a, a, a simple simple word. Now, the total opposite of that, of course, is just plain ex exposition, text after text after text, uh, and. Uh, I mean, I don't know what your opinion is, but most uh, people I know will will just try to skip it or, or click it, and most people will not really enjoy reading a lot of text. They want to they get to the interaction. And I really like this quote. You've probably heard it before from Mark Twain, who wrote, "I didn't have right, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one." And it says a lot about how it actually it's more work to be concise. It, it takes more effort to compress and, and really think about your words rather than just uh, spew them out and and and, uh, and, and shower people with uh, exposition and, and narrative. It's it can be better to place the story into the environment itself. When, especially if you kind of know how your player will be moving through the environment, whether it's a 2D environment or a 3D environment, to put hints and, and put uh, parts of the narrative into the environment which are not necessarily fully spelled out. You could either do like the portal again, where, where like the, you have like obscure scribbling on the, on the wall, or in Fallout, you know, you, you understand what that something dramatic has happened because the way that the environment has has gone through like some sort of cataclysm and, and there's a lot of history in the environment even though it's not being spelled out to you uh the only challenge here is that a lot of players are not as attentive as they think you are like we like to think that our players are looking at all the clues and trying to figure everything out and looking at their, every corner and checking every door and reading every wall but they're not so if something is really important for the narrative of your story, it actually needs to stand out painfully much. It, for you, it's going to stand out like it's going to be like ridiculous how how obvious, like you just put it in a big frame right in front of the player and, and blinking lights around it. And that's kind of the only way you can make sure 
that 90% of your plates will, will see it. Uh, you will see that if you go into, into play testing and you start testing on people who are, are not game designers or hardcore gamers, that uh, people consume games uh, very differently and people who consume games casually will not pay as much attention as you may, uh, you may do. Uh, this is in Half-Life Alex. There's a radio there that you can interact with, and and I think, I think, interactive objects in the environment can be super fun because they they underscore the importance of agency. You like it's not just talking to you. You're given an object and you're interacting with the object, and so you feel kind of you're, you're in control and you have agency. And you're empowered to like discover uh, the environment, and and the and the object is talking back to you. So it's almost as if the object in this case is an NPC without a, a face. You could replace it with a character. It's basically doing the same thing, or has the same purpose as a non-playing character. And it's a great uh, kind of marriage and a great uh, between telling a story and and play and, and empowering the, the player to play. And of course, the uh, dialogue trees of non-playing characters uh, are, are a very classic way to, to tell a story in, and some studios have mastered this, like Bioware. It's important even in dialogue trees to be kind of short and concise. If, if, you're, if you're building dialogue trees, I, I really recommend just not having like walls of text and two, two choices and walls of text and two choices, but rather like be doing like short sentences, choice, short sentence, choice, so then, so that for the experience, uh, the experience for the player is an experience of flow, rather than pausing, reading, then playing. Pausing, reading, then playing. You, you, you. Uh, if there's too much reading, you'll, you'll definitely be breaking flow for the, uh, the the player. The state of of kind of presence and engagement that, that we of course aspire to to maintain. If you're building a game with dialogue trees, I cannot stress enough the importance of using good tools and creating like really empowering your content team with good and simple to use tools and good QA tools as well. I think the studios that have been successful with adventure games that have a lot of uh, dialogue trees or, or interactions have invested a lot in the, in the tools. And you should not keep up them because it, it's too difficult to do updates, to do localization, to do testing. You'll just never reach the uh, quality bar kind of required and, and be able to iterate fast enough uh, to make the game fun and engaging. The, now, in game cutscenes are pretty expensive to make. I think uh, they're, they're the form of, of narrative that's. The most expensive to make if you're going into a motion capture studio, if you're recording audio, uh, especially if it's then uh, localized with different talents and then editing and animating everything together. Uh, obviously, a lot of people then, after all this work and cost, will try to skip the in-game cutscenes as much as they can and press spacebar or, 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 or skip or whatever they can do to, to go past it. it I've I've seen people make cutscenes who simply just wanted to be movie directors uh, who were just stuck as game developers, so they just made a lot of cutscenes. And you really have to ask yourself when you're investing in a cutscene, do we really need it? And uh, will, like, how, what, and, and just like be honest with yourself, how many players, players are going to try to skip the cutscene? And could it be? more concise, could it be more short? Or if you have a lot of story to tell, could you split this cutscene up into four different cutscenes and provide interaction in between? Or, or what kind of interaction can you be like giving while the cutscene is playing? Uh, the longer the cutscene, the, the actually more uh, players will be jolted out of your game and lose the state of flow. Some games, mostly like adventure or large sci-fi games, uh, will have an in-game, something like an in-game codex, which is like an in-game Wikipedia, which gets populated as you explore the world. Uh, I personally believe that it belongs to like a, a genre of older games uh, where audiences would consume games differently. You had games and people would spend more time with each game. 
and their attention would be much deeper on a game and uh, websites or Wikipedia and YouTube perhaps weren't as prevalent or ubiquitous so that the game itself was the only resource to learn about the game. Again, before you start investing in a large in-game codex, ask yourself, could this be simply a novel? Could this be a short story you publish on the website? Could this be a Wikipedia, or, uh, a wiki article that, uh, uh, and, and could I just skip doing, putting this on the website because um, localizing the content, maintaining it and, and editing it can become a lot of work. Uh, th now this is a, a, in particular important in, uh, in uh, free to play games, a mobile game, uh, to put the story and the part of the story into the Futuria, the first time user experience, to really ground the player in, in the world in the earliest uh, kind of interactions that, that they have with the, with the game. I would, I would also stress that uh, I've been involved in projects where we've tried to put a lot of uh, story into the Fatui and uh, discovering that the player doesn't really, isn't in like, hasn't really made their decision yet whether they're going to commit to the game. So yet again, we have to be very careful about how story we are telling them and how much like exposition we're forcing up on them. And it can be it could be more beneficial to have the story unfold over the course of the game rather than, than give them a big, very big lecture or a lot of reading before they can start interacting. Because with, within the Fatui, you're of course trying to introduce the game mechanics. And uh, I think it's very important that you uh, have the player understand what can I do in this game rather than what is this game about. I think uh, doing rather than understanding is, is more important if you're, if you're thinking about a mobile game where you're trying to optimize for the first like 30 seconds or 90 seconds of play because the uh, fall off or the churn in these just first moments is, uh, is, can be really, really high in a, a free-to-play game which people didn't have to invest a lot of effort in uh, downloading. At the end of the day, the People are playing games to have agency, to, to have the power to change the outcome, to feel like they are in control. And uh, I've worked with people from traditional media from, that come over from uh, comic books or from, from screenwriting films that have been brought on to game projects and, and, and are trying to write for games. And, and the issue of agency sometimes come at, like causes friction because because they will like to have things happen to you rather than you like causing things to happen in the environment. And the, the more the, the player feels like they're just a, a ping pong ball or, a, or, a, or, a, or not a ping pong ball, a pinball, sorry, a pinball bouncing around in a machine and they, and rather, rather than the, they are the person who are pressing the buttons, the, the less engaged they are. So, think a lot about like what is the exact story I'm, I'm telling how much agency am I giving to the player what is their freedom and if if you're not giving them any agency but you think it's a very important story that needs to be like told in the world why is it not a novel or a movie like why is it a game I, I've seen game projects that like where uh, where the authors were so precious about the story that they really didn't want the player to change the story at all and they're like then this happens to the player then this happens to the player then this happens to and then they die and then i remember like talking about them like so where's the freedom like no there's no freedom because i've made the entire story i've decided how it's going to be and uh at least in my my opinion that's not really really a game now backstory is is different because backstory basically sets the stage for the game and I like to think about them as kind of backstory is the past. Backstory is like the geology of the environment. Like it's the uh, volcanoes went off and, and, and tectonic plates moved and, and planets clashed together. Like they created this world that, that we are in. 
<laughs> but it but it can never change. The backstory doesn't change. It gets revealed throughout the game, but it never changes. Uh, but the emergent story is all the possible outcomes of the game. Are all, and, and I think it's really interesting when you start thinking about it in that sense, if you, if you draw it up on a whiteboard, like what's completely rigid and what's fluid or what can change? What's the space that, and that the player can move within, like a solution space, kind of like in math, like what's the solution space of potential outcomes, all the potential outcomes and scenarios that, that the emergent story allows for? And, and is it big enough? And what's kind of the ratio of backstory versus emergent story? Uh, Minecraft is a good example. There's a lot of opportunities for the emergent story in, in Minecraft. Uh, the possibilities are kind of endless in terms of like what people can build and what adventures they can have and they can build the castle and then this happens and that happens. But uh, you know, kind of at the other end of the uh, of the spectrum would be uh, the Telltale games, The Walking Dead, and then other games, which were basically a, a branching narrative of of, of interactive cutscenes, and uh, and they, I mean, they're a different form of entertainment. I enjoyed a, a number of them, but if you if you draw up the the potential solution space, and that you realize it's a very sparse, it's, it's just a few nodes, and uh, when you're working on your own game project, like really think about what is the what is the solution space. How big is my emergent story space? Stories, of course, have been in, in games for a long time. I'm not going to go too deep into it, you know, for time. But like, even even the first wars, like the first games, like Space Wars, that are like made in the in the 60s, had had story. If you, if you read up on that, people were making story, and they were inspired by books. And uh, and, and 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 like, I'm old enough to have played like text games that were just pure text and, and really enjoying them. And I find when I'm teaching uh, Python to like young people, uh, text-based games are actually a great way to, to teach them object, object-oriented uh, programming. And, and there's a lot of opportunities and you can actually create very large and open-ended uh, games in text. I'll talk a little bit about kind of what makes an interesting story. Now, I'm sure you, you, know, you probably are familiar with these terms, so I'm just gonna go over it quickly. Uh, what we refer to as the protagonist is the hero of the game. And usually, like in a movie, that's the main character, but in a game, that's usually you. And the protagonist wants something. Now, it's different scene by scene, or maybe throughout the entire game, they, they want something, and there's an object of desire. And Alfred Hitchcock called it a MacGuffin. It's just a made-up word. And, and it's not available to you. You can't get it right now. There are obstacles. The, the, and, and the thing that you need is, is the blue key or rescuing the princess or, or, or gold piece. And the antagonist is the person or, or entity that's putting obstacles in front of us. It's the, the bad guy. And, and But the obstacles can be physical. They can be environmental, financial. Of course, you can afford it. Or internal. You don't feel like doing it or, or you have to overcome some sort of inner, inner struggle. Now, of course, that in games, that's less of an issue. And... Uh, a very important part of storytelling is reversals. Like you, you know this from movies. Like you think you're just about to get it, you're almost about to solve the problem, and then everything flips, and then and the person you you trust turns out to be the villain, or 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 the key wasn't on the second floor. It, the second floor was a trap, and it's on the third floor. And uh, there's something about a reversal, and reversals can be small and large. And if you watch uh, television, or the, each scene usually has one or more reversal. It starts with a setup. The person enters the scene and wants something, and 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 then the power dynamic in the scene changes. Now this may be like something just emotional, and it reverses. So that, so the scene ends with a different emotional state than the beginning. So if you're building levels, or you're, you're or you're building some sort of narrative into your interactive story, think about how how what reversals you can put in there. How how to how does the story flip? How does it change? Because a story that flips and evolves a, a, a more interesting story. Um, let's see, looks like the fonts are gray. Uh, oh, some, some issues with the layout here. 
Now, just to talk a little bit about the elements of the story. The story, story is set in a world which has institutions, characters, conflict, and resolution. If you watch the uh, television show Loki, here's an example of different characters, Loki, Sylvie, and then you have conflict between all of these different elements. Uh, they are in conflict with an institution that's called the TVA, and that institution is in a conflict with another institution called the Alliance of Lokis. And the, and the institution TVA is in conflict with the world, the, the multiverse. Uh, so you have, you have multiple conflicts ongoing. And if your story only has one conflict between one character, or even worse, has no conflict, then it's probably not an interesting story. It's just a sequence of events. And and it's very important when you have conflict and you, and you have somebody who wants to come is in, in one state and wants to get to a desired state to like get the blue key, rescue the princess, become king, that the barriers to overcome feel almost impossible. If, if the barrier to overcome the conflict is very low or very easy, it, it, it's not going to create a, a kind of a release of endorphins in the in the in the brains of, of the players. The, the bigger the barrier, the most more difficult this is uh, kind of the Dark Souls principle, like, you know, if, you, if it's really, really difficult and it and it's presented as, as really challenging, the the, uh, the end boss is very large, it's difficult, like, you use graphics and you use sound and you use everything to, to, to like, underscore how difficult this barrier will become and then they overcome it. This, this generates this feeling of achievement and, and pleasure within the player and if if it's too easy, you're actually losing an opportunity. And this is a, a clear uh, example of where this isn't the case is in serious games. If you've ever seen or been involved in creating like training games where people are simply which are games, but you're being taught to do a task and there's no there's no barrier. It's just like A, B, C, D, E. Then, uh, then people get bored and in very quickly and, and, and fall out of the game. But the conflict can be in a lot of different ways, like you have outer conflict, a conflict between people. But in, in uh, when telling a story, you it usually doesn't isn't really interesting unless the conflict is multidimensional, or a character is multidimensional. So a character will usually, when you think about your favorite movies, or or, or TV shows, or, or game characters, they usually have an inner conflict as well. That that they have to overcome something within them, that. Uh, some sort of fear or, or hesitancy or, 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 or values. They must do something, but it goes against their values or their upbringing. And then lastly, they often have an unconscious inner conflict, which is in conflict with like their conscious inner conflict. So they don't even know it themselves that they are afraid. They don't even know it themselves that they are too proud to do something. And we stand back and we watch that the, 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 the kind of interplay between their inner conflict, their unconscious conflict, and meanwhile, they're fighting the, the outer conflict, and that generates uh, drama. And the outer conflict can be with other people and their desires, things that they want. And of course, it could be with the forces of nature or physics, or with rules or, or institutions like the, the government, the state, or, or the clans, or whatever power structure there are in the, in the world. I like also to think about like linear games and which are, are linear games which kind of start in with a story in one state and move you move through the story but almost everybody moves through the story in the same way will usually have tried to tell the story through characters that our main character actually has dialogue our main character will have an inner conflict things that we see and things that we see evolve within them so they, they sit in a world, the characters sit in a world and the interaction between the characters create the story, what the characters say to each other, how they behave to each other. But in a sandbox world, it's actually not the interaction between the characters, it's the mechanics of the sandbox world that actually generate the story. And the mechanics actually generate the, the play. Uh, and, and it's 
really important that when you are designing mesh for a sandbox world, make sure that they are open-ended enough. There's an example uh, from uh, EVE Online where uh, we uh, had an escape pod in the spaceships. So, so players are, 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 are fighting each other in spaceships. And, uh, and if a player would blow up another player's spaceship, they wouldn't die. They would come out in an escape pod. And the escape pod does your weapons, moves very slowly, and it's a very easy target. It's kind of like a pilot that has jumped out in a parachute in World War II. This presents an ethical choice for the aggressor. The aggressor can choose whether they let the other pilot go because there's no reason for them to, to kill the pilot. They've already blown up the spaceship, they've stolen their stuff, or they can blow up the escape pod to kind of uh, cause even more harm to the player and uh, uh, which was called which will uh, cause some loss skill point loss to the to the other player but it's but it's very cruel to do it and uh, and and we put this in and then lastly when the escape pod blows up the other player's corpse is very morbid will will show up in space and it it's in space and the aggressor has the option to like pick up the corpse and collect it into their cargo hold. So suddenly, like we have took a simple interaction, you blow up another person's spaceship, which is simple. But then we provided the option of blowing up the escape pods, which creates an ethical choice and uh, kind of split up into different kind of schools of thought. Uh, whether uh, whether they were pod killers or whether they were like nice. And then there were some people who were very morbid who would actually collect other people's corpses and print screenshots of like all the corpses that they collected. And uh, and other players like thought that was very morbid and they would like criticize them and judge them and they would talk about it on, on the forums and, and have a lot of conversations about it. And and there would be situations where somebody had blown up a spaceship and people were chatting like, please don't, don't like, you know, blow up my uh, escape pod. And it created a lot of drama and conflict. And we could have just, if we wouldn't have given people these choices, and perhaps what I'm, I'm, this is a long way for me to say, it, we gave people choice, a choice between being good or bad, or, or showing different behavior, not necessarily bullying behavior, but giving people interesting ethical and moral choices created story. So, so that's an, a very good example where we created mechanics in the game, which are very dry, cold mechanics, but but in this context, they uh, generated a lot of story, interesting story and choices, and helped you define basically the, your character. Another thing I want to mention about backstory is the story iceberg. Like uh, usually, you do not want the players to know all the story you wrote. You may have written a lot of story about the game, but but only the tip of it should be apparent to the player. The rest of it helps you design the game, it helps you with the mechanics, it helps you make creative decisions for art or sound or, or, or different things, but don't feel like you have to tell the players all of the story. Like the, the bottom bottom part and the biggest part of the story iceberg is secret to anyone but you, and you meaning like the, the game development team. Uh, this is going back to the, the fact that the mechanics and the elements of how you compose the story are, are really important. I kind of already covered this, so I'm going to talk about this slide. Uh, this is a screenshot from the game Dwarf Fortress, which uh, I, I, maybe it's just game designers that, that play it, and uh, it's incredibly hard to get into, very complex. The graphics, uh, although I have a graphics update now, with the graphics used to be just ASCII characters, and, and it's the story you, you manage a bunch of dwarves who are trying to build a fortress and, and dig their way into like mountains and mine and 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 it's a procedurally kind of driven game and and, and every every game session creates a different story and dwarf fortress was actually one of the inspirations for minecraft and it's interesting because 
because Dwarf Fortress is very hard to get into. It's very hard to understand what's happening or visualize what's happening. And my Minecraft is very easy to get into. I mean, a five-year-old can understand what's happening, get into it, understand the interactions. But it's it's the same design principles of, of being sandboxy and, and open and, and easy to uh, have different different outcomes. But Dwarf Fortress is a, is a great example if you want to like do some research on emergent story play and how how diff, how just the, the rules of the world can generate different and interesting stories. Now I want to talk a little bit about like as you uh, are developing your own games, how to come up with your own story. Now there's a lot of stories out there, and I really recommend trying to avoid copying stories. Just uh, to, we we often will think that uh, our audiences want familiar stories, so that we, that we have to have a story that's a little bit like something that people know already. But it will, but the, the most authentic and interesting stories will be come either from your own thoughts or experiences. These are. Uh, screenshots from a story basically about cancer, child cancer, that track on cancer. The 1970 revolution, nine revolution is made by uh, an Iranian born game developer who uh, was a kid in the, uh, he escaped Iran in 1979 during the 1979 revolution. And the story is, is set uh, in, in those like politically charged uh, times in, in Iran in 1979. Very interesting, very interesting story. And 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 the bottom right there is called Papers, Please. You may be familiar with it, where you uh, are the border guard is in an Eastern European state, and, and you're uh, stamping uh, people's passports and trying to prevent them from uh, getting into the country if they're not supposed to. Which tells, which actually has a has a great story. And it's a really great indie indie game. Uh, but but they're, but they're all like I think these games are all like quite very original and unique in their own way, and uh, and, the, and the people who made them were not afraid to to just tell the stories that they liked rather than try to uh, please some imaginary audience. So so when working on a story, of course, ensure that you know know more about your story than your audience. So if you're going to write this much, then you have to know this much. Like really immerse your brain in books and articles, videos and movies. And uh, when I'm doing research for any creative project, I actually try not to make decisions about the project. I try not to create and research at the same time. It, you, you Sometimes it's a great trick just to like say, okay, for the next three days, I'm just going to read and I'm just going to watch. And I'm not going to write anything or make any decisions to create anything, I'm just going to like soak everything in and, and try to be as open because if you're, if you're trying to create and research at the same time, it can actually be a bit uh, prohibitive. But of course, it depends on what works best for you. If you're creating a story, uh, these are the main elements that you need. You need a world Bible. Now, the world Bible is a document that describes the world that you're in. Uh, it, it, it describes the world story, the rules of the world, and uh, and the mechanics of the world. The character bible again describes the characters, and and it's not necessarily. These are not documents your players will ever read. These are just working documents for you and and, and the team. The character bible describes the characters and, and their background. The game treatment, which is basically the 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 story of the game, like you would tell to a friend if you only have ten minutes. But the log line is the story of the game that you tell to a friend if you only have one minute. Like, what's the game about? Protect the house from invasion because there's zombies going through your backyard. Uh, and I think working on these documents will really help you clarify what story the game, like what the story of the game is. Just having to write them down, write things down forces a decision, forces a creative decision. You may not realize it, that, that something is still ambiguous or we haven't decided until you force your, yourself or your writing team to, to write it down. And then you have conversations and you make decisions and, and it just brings a lot of clarity. And, uh, and it's then very helpful for everybody or the part of the team to be able to refer to this, whether it's art or sound, production, marketing. And, uh, and it's a very ch cheap, these are like compared to writing code or creating art assets, 
it's uh, it's not that expensive to to make this and it doesn't like require a large team but it's really really important again the world bible will describe the background of the world what kind of theme it is what where do the people live what are the dangers but it's not a novel don't write it like a novel it's a it's a working document uh, this is a screenshot from uh, the character bible from stranger things if you watch that you see that there are short descriptions of each of the main characters. Not it doesn't necessarily describe what they look or what their hair is. That will be decided by the the art team unless it's important to the to the story. But what are their fears? What are their flaws? And mostly, how do they relate to the other characters and the institutions of the world? The game treatment will then describe what the plot of the actual game or just the level is. What are the possible outcomes? What's the big beginning middle and end what's the win state now this could be a lot of a lot of different uh documents for for different uh potential outcomes but it's also important that this document evolves because the game design rules will definitely evolve and change and you can't be too rigid about your story if the rules of the game or the game mechanics are changing now and lastly the log line is is, is your simple pitch save the princess from the castle you have to appear into a different dimension and kill a mystical dragon. What's the log line? Try to come up with one for your own game and uh, and be really ready to like iterate it and test it on people. And, uh, and, and having a good log line will bring a lot of clarity to your treatments and to your characters and to your game. And uh, and and uh, can be a very, very helpful tool. So just to wrap up. Games have story, and the story helps your players to understand the game. And understanding the story is going to help you make the game. And, and writing the story is a, is a process of discovery and, and research. And the story will inform the game mechanics, but the game mechanics will also inform the story. And please try to be original. Like, uh, use your own stories and look inside like yourself for your experiences or your culture or your story or your background. To see, like, if you have interesting stories that you can be telling, try. Don't be afraid to be personal and, and quirky. And, and last of us, of course, most of all, uh, have fun. And uh, that uh, wraps it up. And I think uh, we will be shifting into uh, Q and A. Thank you. There's already a few questions here. Uh, now, how does this work again? Will the, uh, is the team picking them out, or will I be? Oh, one more thing. I want to remind you that we will be uh, uh, doing a survey uh, in the handout section. Uh, and we would really appreciate if you could uh, fill, fill out the survey to help us kind of determine how to make these presentations better in the future. OK, here's a, here's a question. Uh, better in game mechanics for the story how to choose the balance between them, considering the decided timeline to launch the game. So, so this is a very uh, common uh, common uh, problem within a game design studio, and I've gone through this and, and, diff and different outcomes of it. So we've decided on a particular story, but it doesn't match game mechanics. Like the game mechanics simply can't support that particular story. Uh, I, I can remember a time in EVE Online where we had a, a system where you could fight for one of the large four empires and there was a war between them. And we had created this like large story about how they were all in war, but then we realized that we couldn't really have them at war. They would ruin the entire, so we would have them in like these small skirmishes. But the story had them in, in big wars, but the game mechanics only had them in small wars. And I would, I would be very much biased towards letting the game mechanics dominate the the story because I, at the end of the day this is an interactive experience and uh, and forcing a story on game i mean hopefully you you will find the the, the story team the writers and the, and the game designers can, can work together on a resolution but uh i like in my per, personal opinion it's 55 percent game mechanics and 45%, like the, the voting rights would be 55% game mechanics and 45% story. Be because 
if you would flip it around and, and the story would dominate the game mechanics, then you're kind of just doing it for the writers. And it's very important for anybody writing or, or, or doing any kind of creative work on a game to leave their ego out of it, to don't be offended if your, your precious story is going to get changed or, or thrown out. Because at the end of the day, it's all about the experience of the player and what, how much fun the, sp the player will have. All right. Here's another story. Can a story evolve purely from a game's mechanics? Uh, that's a really good question. I think I think so. I think uh, sometimes you see the story will evolve from the game's art as well. So let's say that you've created simple game mechanics about connecting dots or connecting lines between the dots, something like very, very abstract. And, uh, and the art team takes a stab at takes a stab at it and decides that it's, you know, chickens, connecting chickens or, 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 or connecting, I don't know, a string of sheep and you're trying to fall asleep or, or you know, you start adding some sort of like tokens or, or things that help you memorize it. Once you have that, then it starts becoming very easy to, to create fabulous, some sort of narrative or story around it. And that can actually be easier then if you start with a very thick and or pre already pre-decided story and are trying to, to figure out the mechanics to, to tell it. So yeah, I, I would say so. Here's another question. Uh, how do you decide on the complexity of the story you want to add in the game? It, I, I think it depends on the, on the audience and the level of, of engagement. Uh, is this uh, a game that they purchased for $60 or is this a free mobile game? How much patience will your user have for the exposition as they start to play the game? If it's a game they paid $60 for, they will definitely sit down and, and they will like, like to research the game. They're okay with watching long cutscenes or, or, or learning more about the game because they've already made the decision and uh, to play it, so they have more patience. But on a free mobile game, they they don't they haven't made a decision to play your game, even if they've gone to the PDB or, or the, and they've downloaded the game and they've installed the game. They're they're still on the fence. They haven't made a decision whether or not they're going to play your game. So your the game mechanics and the interaction like has to be very engaging up front. So you can't load a lot of a lot of story onto them. Uh, Again, I would, I would just try to stress that the amount of story that you write should be much more than the amount of story that is told. Here's a question. What tools do you use for documentation? What method do you use to, um, uh, uh, to write them? Uh, I, and the teams I've worked with, we mostly simply used wikis. Uh, in the like early days, perhaps just like a bunch of Word documents. But what it's best to do is is to have a system that has some sort of tracking. Now, there's a lot of uh, wiki tools out there, but building a wiki that's hyperlinked back and forth, and you can create a page, and you have a history, and you can edit the pages, and you can see who edited the pages, is the best way to create a story world because you need a system that, that supports hyperlinking back and forth, easy sharing, you know, being a, a website and uh, and uh, and a history to see the edit histories, to see how something has changed and see how uh, uh, what the difference is between the document that was made yesterday and the day before. So you can maybe go back and, and, and do that history or, or talk to the person who made that change. So, so I definitely recommend that using an internal wiki and not just emailing Word documents to each other. Uh, now, of course, a lot of people will be using the Google uh, Google Docs and uh, and Sheets, and, and that'd be good as well, but uh, not as good as Wiki because of the hyperlink. Now, the other question that was posed is how often do play games use the three-story, uh, the, the three-act structure that's common in uh, movies and, uh, and books? I would say that they uh, that the three act structure isn't as necessary as you think 
as you, for, for example, start learning about television writing, that uh, a lot of television shows use a seven act structure. A lot of network television use, use a, like there's no magic to it. You can look it up in Google, but, but it's, it's mostly just film because it's based around these 90 to 120 minutes and, and has a very fixed length that that uses the the three act structure uh, so i wouldn't get too married to it or feel that i have to do it especially if your if your game isn't linear if it's not like alan wake or if it's not like a 12-hour game that you don't know how people are going to do walk through it i would rather simply think about like uh you know, beginning, middle, and end of the game, and then its sections. And the sections can be as many as possible, but each section needs to have a beginning, middle, and end, and make sure that the reversals within each section are, are interesting and, and make sense, and, and then lead on to the to the uh, next, next section or, or act. Here's another question. What was the motivation to build narrative-driven experiences using Minecraft, which is amongst the best examples of user-generated stories in the game? Well, uh, Minecraft itself, what we refer to as vanilla Minecraft, uh, which is the Minecraft you download on a, on a console or play just several versions, Bedrock and Java, we very intentionally are not telling you a lot of stories in that. We, we don't want cutscenes, we don't want to up with cutscenes. But the Minecraft world actually has a lot of backstory. And it's it's funny, Minecraft world is a very good example of a lot of secrets. There's a lot of secret uh, stories about like how the world was created, where the Ender Dragon came from, who are the who are the villagers, who are the piglins, uh, stories that are just like kept in encrypted documents at Mojang and nobody nobody can know the truth except a handful of, of story developers. But when we started developing other games, such as Minecraft Dungeons, which you know is set in the Minecraft universe, but is much more traditional in the terms of it's got a you know, linear story play, it has cutscenes, it's got a very well-defined bad guy, it didn't fit that particular game to be as secretive. Uh, so, it, I wouldn't. I would say it's it's less about the IP, but about this particular game being played. How much story you're going to like tell, as a, as opposed to simply uh, kind of hint at. In uh, in in regular Minecraft, doing that would actually steal opportunities from the players to create their own stories in, in vanilla Minecraft, because it's that game is a game about creation and, and storytelling, whereas Minecraft Dungeons is, is a more uh, arcadey game that is simply set in the in the Minecraft universe. That makes sense. Hi, Dor Dorvi. It looks like we're out of time for the session now. Um, been an absolutely fantastic one, though. Thank you so much for making the time to, to come for this. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Sorry yeah. about not answering more questions. There was a lot of in really good questions that came in here. Thank you, everybody who who like yeah. contributed here in the Q and A and the discussion. Um, Dorvi, if you have the time, we can answer. Uh, we can do one last question, but we're actually mm -hmm. at the end of it, so it's it's up to you. We can pick sure, one more if you want to. There's a really nice one called How Can the Understanding of Film or Theatre Be Applied to a Game? Um, that sounds quite cool. I think and the, others are asking yeah. for tips on how to transition from screenwriting. So there's a lot of common threads at play also. Um, Great. Yeah. Well, I think, I think understanding film and theatre, of course, uh, it's mostly about like being invested in a character and and following a character's journey and invested in stakes and how stakes, how, how stake, how reversals happen in, in a story. And that, and, and basically focusing on what are the moments that actually cause an emotional reaction in the play. The, the moments are usually crossing barriers and, and going over some sort of threshold or having reversals, thinking you that you, that you have something and losing it or, 
or, or thinking if you don't have something and gaining it, these are the, the like the transitions. And, and then if you think about that in terms of story, both in film and television, where do these moments happen? And how can you tell, how can you uh, have people experience those moments within game? I think that's the, I think that's the thought exercise for uh, both thinking about what the difference between the two mediums are, but also understanding how to create strong emotional moments in, in, in films and television and uh, and how to create interesting characters. I think, I, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't think of anything like a fast way to, to answer that, but um, I, I think it helps a lot. It's just very important to remember it's a different medium and, and, a, deep, and a medium of agency. All right. Well, uh, Torvi, thank you so much once again for making the time for this. Uh, I think the audience really liked liked what you had to say also. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see you backstage. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank you so very much. Um, folks, we thanks for attending today's session of uh, the IGDC design track. Uh, this is the only session we have today, but Please, uh, tomorrow we have two exciting sessions featuring Van Hasmer from Mediatonic, who is going to talk about how he used sound in the game No Straight Roads. And we have Celia Hodent, who was the UX director on Fortnite. So we hope we see you for that tomorrow. All right, everyone, have a good day.